Well, tonight we are very honored to have the director of Arizona State Museum. Um, and if I went into all the uh, uh, accolades and, and publications that Dr. Lyons has done, I would seriously eat into his presentation time. So I'm not going to do that. Um, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Patrick Lyons. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? OK. All right. So first, I'd like to change things up a little bit tonight by starting my presentation with some acknowledgments rather than waiting until the end. Uh, my talk tonight is a brief distillation of the results of a, a book project made possible by many volunteers supporters, and co-authors. The resulting publication also made possible, was also made possible in part by a financial contribution from the Arizona Archaeological and Historical Society, or as they would say on PBS, viewers like you. <laughs> so thank you to all my colleagues, and thank you to all of you. And I heard from um, one supporter this evening who emailed to say that uh, he was hoping to be able to come because he'd rather see the movie than read the book because he might drop it on his foot and break his foot. <laughs> okay. Um, there are three main topics that I'll cover this evening. Uh, but first, let's do a bit of uh, geography to orient everyone in terms of what's relevant to our discussion. Uh, but again, we're going to look at Rex Gerald. We're going to look at the results of Rex Gerald's excavations and uh, the Davis Ranch site in a larger context related to uh, the Cayenta diaspora, the origin of the Salado phenomenon, and Salado chronology. Ceramic chronology, I should say. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, first we would do a little bit of geography. So first, to get everybody oriented, the Davis Ranch site conveniently in red there. You can see the Reeve Ruin next to it, the San Pedro River Valley. Uh, other things important to our discussion would be the Cayenta region and the Four Corners up here. Um, we'll talk some about Point of Pines. And then uh, this larger area here in, encompassed by the dashed line would be the maximum extent of Roosevelt Redware or Salado Polychrome Pottery. Okay, we'll start with Rex Gerald. Seems like a good place to start, and you'll understand why momentarily. So Rex Irvin Gerald was born in Stanton, Texas in 1928. He received his BA in anthropology from the University of Arizona in 1951, and his AM in anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania in 1957. Between his undergraduate and graduate school years, and during the Korean War, he served in Japan and Korea as a physical anthropologist in the US Army's Central Identification Unit. And here he is. <laughs> uh, Rex Gerald attended the University of Arizona's Archaeological Field School at Point of Pines in 1946, 1948, 1949, and 1956. In 1957, he joined the staff of the Ameren Foundation, filling its first and only pre-doctoral research position. The agreement that established the position called for Gerald to excavate the Davis Ranch site located across the San Pedro River from the Reeve Ruin and to publish the results of his work. The Davis Ranch site consists of a nine-room Pueblo here. Uh, and apparently isolated two-room unit in the plaza surrounded by three room blocks and a compound wall, a three-room and a four-room unit within a few meters of the northwestern perimeter room block, a rectangular kiva east of the compound wall, and a group of nine rooms about 75 meters to the northeast of the kiva, these, which we're not going to talk about tonight, uh, and ten pit houses that predate the Pueblo, and you can see them underneath in an arc, and we'll have other figures so you can see them better. Uh, Gerald excavated 16 rooms, the kiva, and five of the pit houses in their entirety. He nearly completely excavated four of the pit houses, 
dug a small portion of uh, one more of the pit houses and substantially but completely excavated one room. He also, uh, but incompletely rather, substantially but incompletely excavated one room. Uh, he also test trenched 20 rooms as well as a number of extramural areas. He wrote a draft report of his excavations and analyses in 1958. However, this 238 page document was never completed or published. That same year, Gerald left Arizona to work at what is now the University of Texas at El Paso. He was hired as director of the Centennial Museum, a post he held for 22 years, and also assistant and later associate professor of anthropology, a position he held for 32 years. Now, despite the fact that Gerald never completed the Davis Ranch site manuscript, parts of the data set were disseminated. He delivered a paper on this, the Kiva, at the 1958 annual meeting of the Society for American Archaeology, and an analysis of the mammalian fauna from the site was published in 1961 by William Burt in the Journal of Mammalogy. Gerald was awarded a PhD in anthropology by the University of Chicago in 1975, uh, and in his dissertation, he used pollen analyses and faunal data as well as the spatial distribution of ceramic decorative patterns to examine social responses to climate change at the Davis Ranch site in Reeve Ruin. Rex Gerald succumbed to liver cancer in 1990. He is remembered fondly by colleagues and former students as an excellent field archaeologist, a gifted teacher, a pioneer in the field of cultural resource management archaeology, the researcher largely responsible for the government's 1987 decision to restore federal recognition of the Tiwa tribe of Isleta del Sur Pueblo, a key contributor to Spanish Presidio studies, and a master of outreach to the general public. I first became aware of Gerald's Davis Ranch site manuscript and the collections uh, in 1999 and visited the Ameren Foundation to examine both. In 2004, along with William Robinson and Gloria Fenner, I began a reanalysis of the collections. The goal was to complete Gerald's 1958 manuscript while placing his results in the larger context of what is currently known about Cayenta migration into the southern southwest and the role the Cayenta immigrants played in the development and spread of Roosevelt redware, otherwise known as Salado polychrome pottery. The book came out at last in 2019. And as we discussed, it will hurt your foot if you drop it. <laughs> so now moving on to the results of, of Rex's excavations. Um, first thing to mention here are these. Not exactly what you might expect when you're coming to hear about a Pueblo. Uh, but there they are. Uh, two shallow pit structures at the site were likely built and used during the early agricultural period between about 1200 BC and AD 50. Gerald's writings did not indicate whether he considered the possibility that these round houses were pre-ceramic, but based on stratigraphic evidence, they predate the first ceramic period occupation of the site. Their size and shape, as well as the nature of their walls, suggest construction and use during the early agricultural period. Furthermore, Characteristic early agricultural period projectile points have been recovered from the site. Additional evidence includes two fragments of knobbed stone trays. Such objects are known to occur in early agricultural period contexts in the Tucson Basin, the Cienega Valley, and elsewhere. Stratigraphically above the, this occupation is a group of Hoakam houses and pits. And uh, I saw Ron Beckwith out there this evening. These are wonderful drawings by Ron Beckwith. Uh, so we got a Hocom style pit house here with uh, wall channels. And uh, if you can extend this one, you can see this is one of our sort of oval houses with a lateral entryway. Uh, so these structures are associated with red on brown and red on buff pottery. Uh, and also characteristic Hocom shell jewelry pallets, and human cremations. And uh, based on the information that we have uh, from those contexts, it looks like that occupation is between, it, it's during the colonial and sedentary periods. It would be between about eight, AD 850 and 1150. 
Now the main occupation of the site uh, dates to the Hohokam Classic period, and that's what we're looking at now. Um, and uh, we would place this architecture between beginning about 1275 or 1300 and being used until about AD 1390. And it comprises two components. Uh, the first component that you see uh, in gray is an arc of pit houses. And these are um, labeled appropriately as Kayenta pit houses. There are things about their features and the architect, the uh, artifacts rather associated with them that indicate that they were built and used by uh, Kayenta folks. Um, it also appears that the Kiva, which is again at the center of that arc, was constructed when uh, the Pit House Hamlet was first established. Uh, that would mean that the second component uh, dating to uh, the classic period would of course be the Pueblo that overlies uh, two of the pit structures there. So one of the great, oops, this is a little finicky here. Um, one of the great things about the Davis Ranch site is that it doesn't just have uh, one line of evidence that indicates the presence of immigrants from the Kayenta region. Uh, traces of northerners abound at the Davis Ranch site. Gerald's excavations and the reanalysis revealed at least six enculturative markers associated with Kayenta groups. These include the Kiva, entry boxes in at least one of the pit houses, and I'll talk about and, and show slides of these, uh, and entry boxes in, in at least one of the pit houses and four of the surface rooms, locally made perforated plates, which are KN to pottery making tools, locally produced Maverick Mountain Series ceramics, which are Siggy orangeware types or KN to redware pottery made in the southern southwest using local raw materials, a babe and cradle figurine, and a Bull Creek projectile point. In addition to these indicators that point specifically to the Kayenta region as the provenance of the builders and inhabitants of the site, a long list of more general markers of ancestral Pueblo groups that include the people of the Kayenta region was observed, including room block architecture, slab lined hearths, a mealing bin, locally produced pottery made using the coil and scrape technique as opposed to the paddle and anvil technique associated with the Hohokam tradition, shaped shirred pottery scrapers used in the coil and scrape technique, uh, evidence of the use of Rocky Mountain bee weed, presumably for pottery paint, shaped shirred pot rests, monos with finger grips, bifacial monos, a faceted mono, flat matatis, and flexed human burials. In addition, some of the walls of the site are made of shaped and coarsed sandstone slabs. And what I'm gonna do now is take a look at a number of these kind of one at a time and, and um, put up some images. So uh, I've divided this discussion into architecture, ceramics, and other. So we're going to look at architecture. You can see some of those traces we'll be looking at. Um, the first issue is the, the nature of the spatial organization of the community. Uh, what we see at the Davis Ranch site is uh, to put it simply, uh, the northern southwest's traditional way of making above ground architecture. That would be uh, room blocks, where you have many, many walls shared, or what we call uh, high room contiguity. Uh, and this is uh, an approach to architecture that was pioneered by Jeff Clark. And uh, he compared and contrasted room block architecture, where you have lots of shared walls with the typical southern approach to surface architecture, which involves the building of compounds, where you have slides that jump around. Um, <laughs> compounds, where you have um, rooms that are generally independent, uh, but appended to um, these enclosing walls. So everybody sees the difference, correct? All right, very few shared walls. So the Davis Ranch site has room block architecture. And there's a look at the main Pueblo. Okay, nobody move. <laughs> uh, another thing that we see at the Davis Ranch site are Kayenta entry boxes, if they stay on the screen. There we go. Um, Kayenta entry boxes. 
And um, basically what these represent uh, are deflector walls that are built in the doorway of a habitation room to keep any breeze blowing in the doorway from blowing out the fire in the hearth. Can to like to have the slab line hearth near the doorway. Then you have either an L-shaped entry box or in this case a U-shaped entry box made of uh, vertical slabs or low walls. You step into the box and then into the room. Step over the box. So um, here's a look at an entry box at one of the, site, one of the rooms at the Davis Ranch site. You've already, already seen a great picture of the Kiva. Um, this, of course, sticks out like a sore thumb in southern Arizona, not very Hocom. Um, and uh, it has all the features that we would expect. It has a southern platform uh, with a ventilator shaft and a deflector. Uh, it has um, benches that go around, has what appear to be uh, loom anchor holes, and other features characteristic of a kiva that you might see in the Four Corners region. Uh, other things that we see in terms of the ceramics, I'm really going to focus on in terms of time, making sure that the images jump around. I'm going to focus on, <laughs> so pay attention. Uh, I'm going to focus on two things in particular, uh, the Maverick Mountain Series pottery at the site and also the perforated plates. Uh, but the, I've listed those other indicators that I talked about them a little bit already. Uh, so first, um, this is to give you a look at um, this is to give you a look at Segi Orangeware, which represents the origin of, of Maverick Mountain series pottery. Uh, Segi Orangeware is the uh, red and orange pottery that was made in the Kayenta region before the uh, depopulation of the Four Corners. And uh, when folks moved south into central and southern Arizona and other places, they brought their traditions with them and produced this same kind of pottery locally with locally available raw materials. And uh, so what we get is what's called Maverick Mountain Series pottery. And these are examples from the Davis Ranch site. Another thing that we see are perforated plates. And uh, anyone who knows me knows that no, there's nothing more important than perforated <laughs> plates. Uh, but to make a, a very long story very short, they basically represent Kayenta pottery making tools. They're pots for making other pots. And here's an example of, of how they might be made. So they are base molds and um, um, turning forms for uh, making pottery. And you can see the uh, use wear on the bottom of this complete specimen. Now what's neat about these and one of the reasons that we know that they're used for pottery making is that many of them, now that I've been able to go back and look at, either fragmentary or whole ones, is that uh, many of them bear uh, red slip on them as if they were handled by a potter with slip on her hands. Uh, many have been found with um, unfired but tempered clay adhering to the concave surface, and they've been recovered from the burials of aged women associated with unfired pots, uh, tempered clay, untempered clay, temper, uh, material for making pigments, all those sorts of things, and other tools that we know or suspect are used for making pottery. But again, it's a, it's a technology that comes down from the Four Corners region. Um, I mentioned a number of other pieces of evidence, other lines of evidence that come from the stone tool realm. Uh, in terms of the kinds of projectile points that are coming from the site, but also the forms of monos and metates. Uh, flexed burials. This is an, another thing that's really, really interesting. There are uh, 18, I swear to God I'm not doing this. <laughs> there, are, there are 18 um, inhumations at the site, and nine of them have flexed human remains. And of course, flexed burial is something that we would associate with people to the north and not with the, the, uh, the local folks. Uh, we also see the use, uh, distinctive use of raptor remains. Uh, that kiva that you keep seeing pictures of, uh, that, that structure seems to have been um, uh, ceremonially closed and part of that process was to deposit a concentration of raptor bones on the floor. 
Um, we also see differences in terms of the raw materials that were used by the people at the Davis Ranch site relative to the local folks in the San Pedro Valley, including the use of distinctive wood species for construction. The local folks were not putting too much work into going and getting high altitude species, uh, whereas the people at the Davis Ranch site did occasionally getting uh, pine and fir and stuff like that. Okay. So, Starting to put the Davis Ranch site in context, the first thing I want to focus on is the Kayenta diaspora. And, um, you know, the Davis Ranch site is just one of many sites like it in central and southern Arizona, as well as southwestern New Mexico. Um, and this group of sites, stay. <laughs> this group of sites. Uh, has yielded abundant traces of immigrants from the Kayenta region and evidence, also evidence linking these groups to both the origin and the spread of Roosevelt Redware, the ceramic component of the Salado phenomenon. Um, yes. Okay. Wish me luck. That's interesting. All right. Uh, the diaspora from the Kayenta region <laughs> can be traced based on a number of distinct traditions in architecture and ceramics like those manifest at the Davis Ranch site. And these traditions are especially evident in the east and early on in the, in the dispersion from the Four Corners region and become less so over time as immigrants move westward toward, and toward the Phoenix Basin. So let me just see if I can get this to work correctly. There we go. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to be tracking the same sorts of things that we were looking at at the Davis Ranch site. Uh, domestic architecture, domestic features, ceremonial architecture, ceramics, and other markers. And um, there's great evidence of immigrants using those lines of evidence at uh, Point of Pines, the Safford Basin, the Upper Gila of New Mexico, so uh, this area. Uh, okay, so Point of Pines, Safford Basin, Upper Gila, the San Pedro, and believe it or not, all the way over into the Tucson Basin and eventually into the Phoenix Basin. But again, there's a, a diminution over time. Um, and so what I will try to do now, if the slides will oblige me, there we go, is uh, take a look at some more evidence of the movement of slides, no people, the movement of uh, these northern folks uh, out of the Four Corners region and how we trace them. Uh, again, I was talking about domestic architecture and features. Here's another look at another entry box. This particular one that you can see uh, here is at the Reeve Ruin across the river from the Davis Ranch site. Uh, mealing bins are other good indicators of northern groups and flat matatis. Uh, you can see these at uh, Point of Pines Pueblo. There's also a nice mealing bin, believe it or not, here in Tucson at the University Indian Ruin. In terms of uh, ceremonial architecture, uh, we have uh, this as an example of, of a Kayenta D-shaped kiva from Utah. Um, and uh, you'll see uh, in the same way that we have Segi orange ware in the north and eventually we have um, Maverick Mountain Series pottery in the south. People bring this tradition of ceremonial architecture with them. Here's a D-shaped kiva at Point of Pines between the Salt and the Gila Rivers. And here is one at the Goat Hill site in the Safford Basin. Uh, it's worth noting, you can't see them on the map, so you'll have to believe me, that a number of the rooms here at the, at the Goat Hill site actually also had entry boxes like you see at a number of these other villages. Uh, and again, the, the, the most important thing ever in archaeology, perforated plates. <laughs> and now, what's really neat about perforated plates is um, um, they show the spread, the spread of perforated plates shows the spread of Kayenta immigrants through space and time, marking the diaspora. So uh, this image is not only space transgressive, 
but it's time transgressive. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So um, basically this is sites, numbers of sites with perforated plates. And you can see two peaks. You can see this big peak up where perforated plates were invented around AD 500. And you can see this peak down here at the confluence of the San Pedro and the Gila. And um, there are no perforated plates south of the Little Colorado River before about A.D. 1250. And looking at the chronology, so people come down and then they move uh, west and east. Is everybody with me? All right. Um, some more things to take a look at in terms of the diaspora and how the Davis Ranch site fits in. Um, we've talked already a few times about Maverick Mountain series pottery. Here are some more examples of Maverick Mountain black on red and Maverick Mountain polychrome. Uh, and here are some examples of Tucson polychrome, including the type specimen from Martinez Hill ruin here in Tucson. That one's for you, Mike. And uh, if we look here, uh, we're going to be looking at the distribution of Maverick Mountain series pottery. Uh, so that's the known distribution of Maverick Mountain series pottery. Let's compare that to the map that we just looked at. Uh, and so here's our perforated plates. Here's our perforated plates. Here's our, our um, peak in the south. It overlaps completely with the peak of Maverick Mountain series in the south. Does everybody see the good correlation there? Um, and then um, we can look then at uh, an even better match, if, this, if the maps would stop moving, an even better match between uh, not just the overall distribution of Maverick Mountain series pottery, but the peak distribution. Does everybody see that? And uh, this one is nice also because it shows uh, this is the former distribution up here of Segi Orangeware, which begat Maverick Mountain series pottery. Okay? And uh, the Kayanta homeland here is the former home of perforated plates, and then they show up down here. Um, this is the former home of entry boxes, and then they show up in this area. I'll see that a little bit differently in this slide. So again, um, wow. Okay, um, this is going to be great to watch when people watch this video. <laughs> I can tell. Um, so again, the Kayanta homeland, Segi Orangeware, everybody got it? Uh, perforated plates. Um, Segi Orangeware now pale. Here we got Maverick Mountain series, and we got perforated plates down here. Because everybody leaves here. All right, so those are, those are the, the major robust material culture patterns that really go along uh, to allow us to describe uh, the Kayenta diaspora. And um, I should have mentioned two things about diaspora. The first is not only does it, does it comprise a, a network of uh, dispersed enclaves of people who come from one place, but originally, but go to many different places. But um, they remain connected to one another through that network, and they pass raw materials, uh, goods, information, uh, even ritual, ritual specialists along that network, ethnographically speaking. We see that around the world. And um, in terms of the diasporic network of the Kayenta, um, there are some really, really interesting uh, evidence for it. The first uh, interesting nugget here, there is that the Davis Ranch site and the Reeve Ruin are apparently the only two sites south of the Mugion Rim to have produced evidence of the presence of Rocky Mountain beeweed. Uh, it does not grow south of the Mugion Rim uh, naturally, and it seems that the, tra the plant was traded down into the San Pedro from the north where people were still using it for pottery paint, presumably to people in the south who wanted to use it as pottery paint, which was traditional back in the old country. Um, <clears throat> another thing that shows the, another phenomenon that shows the network uh, operating is um, the distribution of obsidian. And this is research spearheaded by Jeff Clark of Archaeology Southwest. 
He's shown that other groups of Kayenta immigrants settled uh, adjacent to the Mule Creek Obsidian Source in the upper Gila area of west central New Mexico, and that these folks and other Kayenta immigrants in the Safford Basin appear to have been involved in exchanging this valuable commodity obsidian down into the San Pedro, and the, the Kayenta immigrants in the San Pedro then exchanged it with the local groups in the San Pedro. And we can tell this not only based on the sourcing, so chemical trace element sourcing was done um, to establish where the, the obsidian ultimately came from, but we can track the way that it's moving through the economic system based on uh, its frequencies at different kinds of sites. So, um, before the immigrants, there's a little bit of obsidian in uh, the San Pedro Valley. By the time the immigrants come, there's a tenfold increase. And most of the obsidian is at the sites that we identify as immigrant enclaves based on uh, architecture and other traces. And then we find a little bit of obsidian then showing up at uh, the sites occupied by the locals. Uh, now another thing that will, would show uh, the diasporic network maintaining itself over generations is the incredible consistency and similarity of Roosevelt Redware pottery over a huge distance, a huge area, all the way from western Arizona to east of the Pecos up to uh, practically Winslow, Arizona, well, Winslow, Arizona, for real, uh, and all the way down to Pakime. So a huge, huge area. Across that entire zone, people are, for generations, uh, making pottery that is virtually indistinguishable in terms of its technology and its design. Uh, and that speaks to a lot of communication across that vast area. Now the next bit of context. Uh, this has to do with uh, the Salado phenomenon. That's good, right? Whoops, it was good. OK, uh, what is Salado? Steve Lexon says, it's a phase all archaeologists go through. <laughs> That's a good answer, right? So um, unfortunately for us, uh, Salado does not hang together like other archaeological units of analysis. It's not like Ancestral Pueblo or Mogollon or Hoakam. Uh, the only thing in common across this large area that I was describing, you know, that, that dashed line, the only thing that all those groups have in common are a series of related pottery types called Roosevelt Redware, formally, or Salado Polychromes, informally. Um, what I would say, and it's pretty similar, oh, and this is the pottery that we're talking about, Roosevelt Redware, so we have Pinto Poly, we had Pinto Polychrome, Gila Polychrome, Tonto Polychrome, that's the original triumvirate, and we'll, we'll add to that. Prepare to be glazed. Um, wow. Uh, OK. Um, Jeff Clark has a particular uh, metaphor for Salado. Uh, and what I'm going to say is pretty similar, I think. He talks about uh, Reese's peanut butter cups, those of you who've seen that. Uh, but basically, the way that Kayenta, the Kayenta diaspora and Salado come together for me conceptually is uh, the following three statements. Uh, evidence like what's found at the Davis Ranch site turns up at many, many different sites in the southern southwest. Uh, and what we see over and over again is that evidence of the northern immigrants is consistently associated at the same sites with evidence of Roosevelt Redware production. And so to me, Salado is what happens when northern immigrants mix with different local groups under different local circumstances. And that's why the only thing that hangs together is the ceramic tradition that was brought by the immigrants. Everything else is malleable. So I'm going to show you, whoa. I'm going to show you another series of maps. And I hope you don't get seasick or car sick or uh, another series of maps to, to make the connection here. Um, these are data that we had to work with before uh, the work with the Davis Ranch site collection and before the recent survey and excavations of the San Pedro. Um, but the data from the Davis Ranch site really pull it all together. And so what I want to show you here, what we're looking at here, 
is the fact that, um, you know, this is the, the first area that we've been talking about with Salado. That's the maximum distribution of Roosevelt redware or Salado polychrome pottery, but really what that represents are the late types, Gila polychrome and Tonto polychrome. It turns out that the earlier types, Pinto polychrome and Pinto black on red, have a much more restricted distribution in space. And so you can imagine this in the middle of that, right? Of course you can, you're smart people. Okay, now I know I keep slipping this, wow. I know I keep slipping this image in here, but uh, it's for a reason. Again, um, notice any similarities, right? This is our distribution of perforated plates. This is the earliest uh, Salado pottery, uh, Roosevelt redware types, Pinto polychrome and Pinto black on red. And what's real interesting is these are actual type specimens that were used by Harold Gladwin. That Well, they were. There they are. These are the actual type, some of these are actual type specimens that were used by Harold Gladwin um, and other people to define uh, Roosevelt Redware and uh, Pinto Polychrome. And if you'll notice, well, actually, these, these two are part of the, the Gladwin collection, the Gila Pueblo collections. This is another one. Um, notice these um, handles on the sides, these loop handles on the side. That's a, a characteristic of Kayenta pottery. And the designs that we see painted on the insides of those come right out of the Kayenta tradition. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, um, quite a long time ago, when Emil Howery was trying to uh, conceptualize for people his understanding of Salado, he used uh, this diagram uh, based on the idea that was no longer um, believed in by most people of a Tonto Basin heartland or homeland for Salado. Uh, that's a historical accident. If Salado studies had begun in the San Pedro, we would never talk about the Tonto Basin as being the home of Salado. It would be crystal clear what's going on. It would be obvious that there's an association between Cayenta immigrants and the Salado phenomenon. But there you have it. Anyway, what Doc was trying to point out is with this series of circles that were open to different degrees, you see this one's very open, these are partly open, these are more closed. Uh, he was trying to talk about receptiveness of local people in those different places to the Salado phenomenon. Uh, I decided to color code it because I think it's easier, but really what it does is it demonstrates uh, the density of Roosevelt Redware pottery in these different places. It's densest in Safford and the San Pedro and southeastern Arizona in general. The next uh, place, the next most dense concentrations are at Point of Pines region, the Salt Gila and the White Mountains, and there isn't much in these other places and almost none out there, which is really interesting because again, you guys are sick of this, right? You get the point. Persistent patterns, that makes it easy for us. Okay. Um, <clears throat> other than those patterns, um, those spatial patterns, another thing that we have to talk about is the fact that about uh, 95 or 96 percent of Roosevelt Redware whole vessels that I've been able to take a look at, um, their um, decorative designs, their layouts, and um, symmetry patterns, the rules of decorative uh, division of space come directly out of the system that was designed. Uh, th they can be categorized with the system designed by Watson Smith to categorize ancestral Hopi pottery uh, and Kayenta pottery. It comes right out of the Kayenta tradition. And um, ethnographically, what we find, what ethnoarchaeologists find is that when you see faithful um, reproduction of the decorative division of space and layout and symmetry and things like that. What you're seeing uh, is the movement of people and uh, the movement of traditions as opposed to copying. And so that's why I and other archaeologists focus on layout and the rules of decorative design as opposed to more easily copied things like particular motifs, the shape of this triangle or square or whatever. And again, there, it's a lock that the origin of Roosevelt Redware or Salado Polychrome Pottery is the Kayenta tradition. Now, it helps a lot that we get stuff like this. This is a, a low frequency phenomenon, but it's persistent and it shows up 
uh, at many of these immigrant sites, and it lasts for a long, long time. We get bowls that are Roosevelt Redware on the inside and Maverick Mountain Series pottery on the outside. So they have Gila polychrome or Pinto polychrome or Cliff polychrome designs on the inside and Tucson polychrome on the outside. They were trying to tell us something. Everybody still with me? All right. So uh, excavation and analyses conducted between 1999 and 2012 by Archaeology Southwest, formerly the Center for Desert Archaeology, focused on 29 classic period sites uh, in the lower San Pedro Valley and provided an opportunity to place the Davis Ranch site in comparative context uh, relative to Salado uh, in an important way. And one of the major foci for Archaeology Southwest's San Pedro Preservation Project was exploring the relationship between Cayenta immigrants and the development and spread of Roosevelt Redware. Uh, a really important tool uh, for those of us who worked on this project was a petrofaces model of the entire 140 mile long San Pedro Valley and its major tributary, the Aravaipa Valley. Thanks to that, there is compelling evidence that the Cayenta immigrants and their descendants who lived in uh, the area around the Davis Ranch site and the Reeve Ruin were among the principal producers of the Roosevelt Redware vessels in the valley. So we know the immigrants were producing Roosevelt Redware at the Davis Ranch site and other enclaves because we can match the sand temper in the pottery with different and unique sand deposits in the valley. Uh, these data show that almost all the Roosevelt Redware, all of the Maverick Mountain Series pottery, and almost all of the perforated plates in the valley were made with sands right next to the sites identified architecturally as immigrant enclaves. What's more, it looks like as if this pattern holds in other parts of the southern southwest, in that each valley has, had, has one or more enclave site where immigrants were producing Roosevelt Redware. Now to sort of bring it on home, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what came out of the Davis Ranch Site Collection Restudy in terms of shoring up ceramic chronology. And we're closing in on the end, I promise. Um, The data from the Davis Ranch sites support recent changes to Roosevelt Redware typology and also lend strong support to Patricia Crown's stylistic seriation. Why is this important? I'm glad you asked. Both of these tools, the new typology and the stylistic seriation, can be used to help refine the chronology of the southern southwest where tree ring dates are few and far between. I recently defined a number of new pottery types in Roosevelt Redware. Cliff polychrome, Nine Mile polychrome, Phoenix polychrome, and others, based on vessel form and where decoration occurs on the vessel. Clues from other sites suggested that these were introduced later than Gila polychrome. So this is Gila polychrome, and what you're looking at here, these are hemispherical bowls, the normal bowl shape that you're used to. These later types that I'm talking about like Cliff Polychrome and Nine Mile Polychrome and Phoenix Polychrome, these are recurve bowls. Can you see the shape? Curve in and out, right? Uh, Cliff Polychrome is defined by a recurve bowl form, and the decoration is predominantly on the interior. Nine Mile Polychrome uh, is defined by a recurve bowl form, and the decoration is predominantly on the outside and then also on the interior at the rim, but the rest of the interior is slipped red. Phoenix polychrome, same vessel form, but the entire interior is slipped red and all the, decor all the painted decorations on the outside. Now, um, it just so happened that there were a lot of clues that not only were these as a group later than Gila polychrome, but that there was a sequence where Cliff came first, then Nine Mile, then Phoenix polychrome, but there was no real way to date that stratigraphically until work with the Davis Ranch site collections. 
And so uh, the Davis Ranch site provided this opportunity. Uh, we were able to test the sequence and found that stratigraphically, in all cases, the chronological order I had predicted uh, was observed. And so um, this was seen not only in superimposed trash field architecture, but also in um, the different burials and the different strata of the kiva. The kiva, after it was abandoned, uh, became a cemetery. It was filled with trash and it also became a cemetery. And uh, it turns out that looking at the pottery types in those different burials that could be arranged stratigraphically and looking at the pottery from um, um, superimposed architecture, so uh, trash that's in a pit house below a room in the Pueblo, for example, um, you get a really, really strong pattern. So um, here's an example. And in any time we had a significant um, um, sample size, the patterns held the, the same way. Um, now, Patricia Crown's seriation, what Patricia Crown did is she took the types Pinto, Gila, and Tonto from the original triumvirate of Roosevelt Redware, and she defined styles that cross-cut all those pottery types because she was trying to uh, find smaller slices of time or more precise slices of time. So you can see this. Um, she defined these different styles and stages, Pinedale st stage one, Pinedale style stage two, so on and so forth, and arranged them in such a way that you could um, look at a site where you might have the same pottery types at two sites, but because of the styles that they display, one could be shown to be earlier than the other. Is that clear with everybody? Okay. It turns out that when you apply uh, Crown's stylistic seriation to the same stratigraphic sequences at the Davis Ranch site where the pottery typology works out the way it should, her stylistic seriation works out the way it should as well. It's not violated in any place where we have any significant um, sample sizes. And so I'd like to conclude my prepared remarks with a bold but I think easily defended statement, and that is that existing museum collections are critically important resources for archaeological research. Museum collections are invaluable sources of information because as knowledge and scientific methods advance, researchers can ask old questions in new ways and ask new questions that previous generations of investigators never imagined could be addressed. And so with that, I'll be happy to go to questions. Yes. Um, was anyone able to determine why there was such a gap from the north to the south that they didn't you know, uh, inhabit the central part? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. It seems like, um, so if we're talking about that map where people are moving, let me get back to that. Okay. Is that what you're talking about? Um, <clears throat> in part, it seems that, and, and we see this um, in the archaeological record, it seems like people are moving to places where they already have some kind of social or economic connections. So it seems that um, there is evidence of exchange between some of the northerners, for example, and people in the Point of Pines region before those immigrants show up in the Point of Pines region. And so, uh, and it just kind of stands to reason that people would want to go to places where they had some sort of advanced knowledge. So I think that's part of it. The other thing has to do with, um, there, there probably are some knowledge gaps in here. Um, there, the land jurisdiction is a little bit weird in that part of the state, and so the coverage isn't, isn't as good as in, as in other areas. But, but yeah, it does really seem like a pretty straight shot to the south. It's a good question. Yes. So when the, when the Davis Ranch site was abandoned, where did the people go? Oh, that's a great question. When the Davis Ranch site was abandoned, where did the people go? Well, um, you know, the San Pedro Valley was not cleaned out all at once. The evidence that we have suggests that um, people 
moved, uh, there was a sequential depopulation of the valley. And so Davis Ranch site is like here. Uh, what we see over time is that uh, villages in this zone are depopulated and people concentrate here at the confluence of the Gila and the San Pedro, the best places for the best place for agriculture right there, and then also uh, at the confluence with the Aravaipa that you can't see here. So um, the, the, sh the, the long answer is, first people uh, leave these sites and congregate near the confluence, and then later um, we um, hypothesize that uh, most of these populations then went uh, places north like Hopi and Zuni. Uh, there's particularly good evidence uh, at the proto-historic villages at Zuni of Roosevelt Redware pottery uh, that is uh, very late. It shows up late at Zuni, and the kind of types that we see at Zuni uh, are those late types that uh, were defined on the San Pedro. Good question. Yes? This is the first I've heard of perforated plates. Oh! You're my new best friend. <laughs> this is the first she's heard of perforated plates. Yeah, you got six or seven hours. Okay, so what is, what is the purpose of the holes? Um, so uh, most, um, we'll go back so this discussion gets the full impact <laughs> that it deserves. There we go, okay. So um, the typical perforated plate has one circumferential row of perforations, uh, and that's what we're used to seeing uh, in archaeological sites. Um, however, um, many of them have two circumferential rows or three circumferential hole, uh, rows of holes, or a cruciform pattern as well as a circumferential row, or um, uh, they're perforated at uh, the quadrants or halfway around or they have little pinpricks where the holes ought to be or they have holes painted on. And actually even the ones that have real holes, um, uh, on all of the hole specimens that have been looked at, about 20% of the holes are actually closed up by the withdrawal of the perforating instrument or by post-perforation smoothing. So it doesn't seem to have been important that the hole was actually open. Um, Archaeologists have talked a lot and thought a lot about what the holes might have to do with pottery making, and they probably don't have anything to do with pottery making. They don't have to do with drainage because traditional pottery making is not as wet as wheel throwing. Um, they are not layout guides for painting because if they were used that way, um, you would see really bad uh, splotches on the pot if it were painted in a pookie like this. Uh, if you've seen traditional potters paint, it's they're using both the painting hand and the whole hand holding the vessel and, and moving in a smooth way to not drip paint all over the vessel. You drip paint all over it if you used, if you painted it in that kind of thing. Um, so the slightly long answer is that um, uh, because there's no clear evidence that it has anything to do functionally with pottery making, uh, um, Howry and I uh, believe that they were either decoration or owner's marks. And the reason that's important is that we know ethnographically and we suspect uh, prehistorically that potters worked in groups together. And these are things that you would set pots on to dry while you're doing different things. Uh, and then also it's important to point out that there are many, many, many unperforated plates at all of these sites. And they're very, very common in the Cantor region. It's just that the perforated ones are easy to find in shirt assemblages and on the surfaces of sites because the holes were put in before the vessel was fired. That's the, that's the fastest I've answered that question ever. <laughs> yes? Um, some of these sites in San Pedro had platform um, Yes, the local, the, the home team, the local folks who uh, were uh, longtime participants in the uh, Ho'okam archaeological tradition, they, uh, they had the same sort of material culture that we see in Tucson and Phoenix in that early on they had houses in pits, they had red on buff uh, or, and red on brown pottery, uh, cremated the dead, had ball courts and later had compounds and platform mounds, yes. So uh, when these uh, uh, 
uh, Northern Mission group here, they got peeves with them. Any idea about the relationship between the platform mounts and the kivas in terms of time and use? Both were used at the same time by different groups on the same day, or what's going on there? So the question is, uh, what's, the, what's the nature of the overlap, temporally speaking, between the northern ceremonial structures, the kivas, and uh, the local ceremonial structures, the, the platform mounts? They overlap in time, and then eventually the kivas go away. In fact, at the Davis Ranch site, people continue to live there for quite a while after they stop using the kiva. It seems that at some point they bought into the local, at least part of the local ritual tradition. Uh, there is uh, a platform mound not too far away from the Davis Ranch site. Yes? Um, speaking of the kivas, in the several of the images, uh, you have marked the loom anchors. Yes. So um, I'm trying to connect my concept of a kiva being a ceremonial structure and now a kiva being a place where the women gathered in wood. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Uh, so, um, so the first thing is um, uh, traditionally, ethnographically, in Western Pueblo, Kiev, so Hopi and Zuni and Akama and Laguna, but certainly Hopi, uh, which is what I know best, I'll stick to what I know, um, uh, the weaving is done by men. Uh, weaving is very enmeshed in, and, and cotton is very enmeshed in, um, enmeshed, that's good, <laughs> in uh, the ritual system. And uh, the weaving traditionally is done in kivas by men. And so that's a, 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 a long-standing tradition that goes back um, uh, a thousand years or more uh, in, in northern Arizona. So they kept it secret. The men were in there <laughs> not letting the women see. Um, well, uh, so strictly speaking, it, so the question is about secrecy in kivas. So, um, people often think about everything happening in kivas as being secret, and there is that aspect of it that different par ethnographically, so based on uh, the living people today, and again, Hopi is, is what, what I have experienced the most of, um, and among the Hopi, at least, uh, there are portions of secret, there are secret portions of some ceremonies that are performed in the kiva, that are only attended by those who are initiated into that ceremony. However, there are more public or semi-public aspects of other ceremonies where uh, uninitiated people are allowed to uh, see what's going on or be there for a little bit of time. And women and children will be in the kivas at those times. And then also, um, there are women's ceremonial societies uh, in the Western Pueblos, as well as men's ceremonial societies. And uh, the uh, non-public portions of those ceremonies are conducted in kivas. Long answer, but did you get it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is that it? Thank you.